not on. Well, unfortunately not unless you turn around, sorry. Yeah. And a laser. Bright green. And a backup laser in case the first laser breaks. Okay, if you could all come in and take your seats, we're about to begin. Oh, everyone went very quiet, very quickly. This is good. Got them well trained. All right, hello everybody. Welcome again to the 50th LPSC conference. We actually made it to 50. And we have a, obviously a fantastic program, as you all know, you wouldn't be here. Um, but I do want to let you know that we have a record number of attendees. We actually have 2,064 registrants. That's about 250 more than we've ever had before. So it's really a fantastic number. So uh, for those that weren't at the Mazursky session earlier, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Louise Proctor. I'm the director of the LPI. Um, and the LPI, of course, puts on this conference every year. So I want to thank my amazing staff for their efforts doing that, always. <laughs> and I also want to introduce my co-chair, Eileen Stansbury, who's sitting here. She's the chief scientist at JSC. <laughs> this is great. They're all in a great mood. Fantastic. Um, also want to thank those of you who are on the program committee. Um, anyone who's been involved with the program committee will know that about 35 people show up in Houston for a very intense sort of three, three and a half days to put this program together. And this year that happened um, during the shutdown. And so about a third of our program committee, including one of the program committee chairs, Dave Draper, were furloughed and were not able to attend. And so I actually want to thank Walter Kiefer and everyone else on the committee who just all hands to the pump to make this happen. So you did a really fantastic job. Um, obviously, we missed our uh, government uh, participants, but I think we still came up with a good program. Um, I also want to mention that there are six people who have attended all 50 meetings. And I hope you're all here, otherwise you're making a liar of me. And I'm, I'm going to read your names. I'd actually like you to stand up. So, Don Burnett, I know you're here because you asked a question earlier. Where are you, Don? <laughs> all right. And then Dimitri Papanastasio. Dimitri here. Very good. Everett Gibson. Larry Nyquist. Who's Larry? Let's see him. Maybe he's having an early dinner. I think you're allowed after 50 years. Uh, and Pete Schultz. There's Pete. And Pete actually wrote a little article for our LPI bulletin uh, where he talked about sneaking into the first meeting. It was invitation only. He wasn't supposed to be there, but he was a grad student. He snuck in. So it's tenacity for you. 
And then, last but not least, this guy's not a scientist, but the shuttle driver for the first and many subsequent meetings, who still comes to our poster sessions, even though he's long retired, is Dominic Nodo. So some of you know Dominic as well. So, and I've been asked if we can do a lifetime free registration for all those people. So we'll, t we'll think about that. We'll take that under advisement. I think you probably have earned it. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the pioneers uh, early on in Planto sites are no longer with us, and this brings us to the sort of sad part of our program. We do want to just take a few minutes to honour our friends and colleagues who passed away in the, far in the past year. So we're just going to do a small slideshow, and if it's possible to bring the lights down, I would appreciate it. Thank you.
Okay, good evening. It's my uh, honor and pleasure to be able to introduce our panel uh, this evening. But before I do that, I'd like to take just a quick moment, since we've got uh, some new faces here, to also thank um, uh, uh, someone who has been on this stage many, many times before and isn't this year, uh, Jim Green. I'd like to thank you for the amount of work that you've done to make planetary science. Okay, for the speakers this evening, we have uh, going right down the row. Nice that you'll set that <laughs> in order. <laughs> um, and then I'm just going to introduce them all at once, and they'll do the handoff themselves. They're competent to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let me down. <laughs> we have uh, Steve Clark, who is the Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration in the Science Mission Directorate. We have Jake Bleacher, who is the Acting Chief Exploration Scientist in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. We have Lori Glaze, who is the Acting Director of Planetary Science Division for the Science Mission Directorate. And the, uh, Michael New, uh, who's the only new, uh, non-new uh, panel <laughs> direct <laughs> member, <laughs> uh, who's the do Deputy Associate Administrator for Research in the Science Mission Directorate. And thank you all for agreeing to do this tonight. Okay, well, good evening. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first LPSC, um, and it's actually an honor to be here, particularly on the 50th anniversary of LPSC. Uh, and so, um, and I, I thank um, both Louise and Eileen for their leadership, and of course the extended folks that helped to make this happen. I know it's quite an endeavor every year, all of these type conferences are, so thank you very much. I think we should give them a round of hands. Okay, so here comes the competency part, if I can handle IT equipment or not. So um, just for a little bit of background, um, as, as Eileen said, I'm the Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration and SMD. This is a new position that was established um, in July of last year. And it was really established to push the exploration campaign further um, with science going with humans. And so um, you'll hear a little bit from me, a little bit from Jake, and probably from Lori as well on how this is working within the agency. I'm gonna cover it at a high level, and certainly we'll look forward to questions that uh, once we're all done presenting. So the exploration campaign really is born out of the space policy directives, particularly number one, um, which is reinvigorating America's human space exploration program. But again, science is gonna go with humans um, we're actually going to pave the way prior to humans um, returning to the moon. Um, SPD 2 and 3 still play into that as well. There is a fourth uh, space policy directive that established uh, the Space Force, but uh, we're, we're not part of that um, so, <laughs> so far. Uh, <laughs> so uh, at any rate, this, this is the charge that we have as an agency to lead this exploration campaign um, and it's really in, in kind of three theaters. One is low Earth orbit uh, with ISS transition and uh, basically helping to build e-commerce in low Earth orbit. The lunar campaign as well, returning humans to the moon, also doing robotic science, ISRU and so forth. And then feeding forward to Mars as well and planning that first human exploration to Mars. So this is what we call the swish chart um, at headquarters. And it's really a high-level um, kind of a, a architecture for uh, human and science exploration. Um, and you'll see the top part is um, in the green swoosh are what we are the orbital assets, right? We have the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter continues after 10 years operating very well, providing us uh, uh, excellent science data still. Um, and now we're also going to be using LRO to help characterize potential landing sites for our commercial partners and our international partners as well. 
Um, Artemis has been flying as well. And then you'll see the Orion spacecraft. And eventually we get to around the 22, 23 time frame, the first element of gateway, the power and propulsion element. Um, and then uh, that will continue to be evolved. And then on the surface, I, we start on the, on the lower left with ISS that I mentioned. Um, and then you see the small commercial landers. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in my following slides, but we're very excited to be talking about the commercial lunar payload services. Um, and then we've got the enhanced science and exploration capability. I think we all agree that we need mobility. We need rovers to do a lot of the uh, science investigations and ISRU. Um, and then we get into the uh, Lunar Lander Descent Module demo, which is for the human uh, descent stage. And I think Jake will probably talk a little bit more about that. Um, all leading up to returning humans to the surface of the moon on the far right. And I do want to point out in the upper right corner, you see Mars. Because again, what we're doing now as we're developing technologies, uh, we're looking for ways to feed forward those technologies to the first human exploration of Mars. And of as you know, we continue to explore Mars robotically, which is helping us as far as a precursor for the first human mission. There we go. So from a technology development standpoint, um, you'll see SMD on the top, the Lunar Discovery and Exploration Program, which, which I'm responsible for. And we've got commercial landing delivery services. And certainly we're going to start with the, with the CLIPS landers but we're also gonna evolve into uh, greater capability as cadence picks up and as capabilities mature and um, more companies come online along with our original CLIPS vendors as, and develop the, the capabilities that we can take uh, larger payloads to the surface. Um, and NASA is not gonna be the only customer of these commercial services. We wanna be one of many customers. Um, and the technology development in the middle lane is the Space Technology Mission Directorate. We work very closely with them, and as you can see with the, the prop design, with the deep space engine feeding into the commercial landers, uh, precision landing, and certainly that's going to have applications to the, the human lander design as well. Um, cryofluid management, ISU surface power, all of these technology developments are going to feed into robotic exploration with greater capabilities along with the human exploration as well. And that's why you'll see those arrows also go down to the HEO line with the uh, human lander descent, and then eventually the uh, full-up descent and ascent vehicle with humans. So a little bit about the organization. You know, you, you got to have at least one org chart in here, right? So uh, the moon to Mars uh, effort, as, as we've heard about, and the administrator rolled it out during the budget rollout as well. You can see in the green box where uh, my office is located under the science mission directorate. Um, and then I've got a, a Jay Jenkins, his uh, program executive who just came on board a little while ago, along with Ben Bussey, who a lot of you know, he's my senior scientist, and we're finishing up interviews on a program scientist that'll be directly uh, reporting to me. And so here soon we'll have four of us that are managing the uh, LDEP, or Lunar Discovery and Exploration Program. And what I wanna share with you is, not only are we working with the human spaceflight uh, folks and the Space Technology Mission Director folks, but we're working across the science divisions with his, within SMD. And I can talk a little bit more about uh, that later, but what we want to integrate all of the needs of the science um, divisions and representing the community as we go forward with all of these commercial endeavors that we're doing to return to the moon, um, along with Gateway and so forth like that. Um, so I'll, I won't talk about the lower boxes there right now because I've, I've got another slide that'll talk about that, but that's really what's within the LDEP program, which is right here. Um, I've talked about CLIPS. Um, we're managing the instrument development to fly on the CLIPS missions. I think most of you are aware we, we awarded um, 13, um, I should say selected 13 NASA-provided instruments to fly on the early CLIPS missions. Um, then we had a lunar surface instrument and technology payload call. The step two proposals are in and undergoing evaluation, and we're looking forward to awarding those in the May-June timeframe. So what we're trying to do is build a robust pipeline of instruments that we can then take to the surface uh, with our commercial lunar payload services uh, contractors. 
Um, DOLLY, Development and Advancement of Lunar Instrumentation, is, is also being funded under LDEP as well. So again, we're looking a little farther upstream to develop those instruments. Uh, I talked about LRO, uh, the Mission Operations budget is now within LDEP. Um, and we're also looking at the simplex calls that Planetary puts out for those that have uh, direct applicability to lunar exploration. Um, and future mobility capabilities, so I talked about rovers. Uh, but we also need comm and data relay assets. As we put more instrumentation on the surface or in cis-lunar, we're going to need a lot of comm data uh, bandwidth to be able to transmit that data back to Earth and back to the researchers. And so um, we're looking at ways to do that as well. So I talked about CLIPS. Uh, the contract awards were announced in November, and we had a, a rollout at NASA headquarters in early December. Um, those are the nine companies that are now on contract with NASA. Um, so what we will do is issue what we call task orders when we want to take instruments um, to the surface of the moon. And uh, they are, there are on-ramps that will be possible where we'll do other missions, such as orbital missions as well. Um, and then as the capabilities uh, grow to be able to do larger payloads, as I mentioned before, or rovers, we'll be uh, going out with task orders to our uh, CLIPS contractors. And what they do is then they can decide to bid, and they'll come and they'll bid to these requests on these task orders, and we'll do assessments through those, and then award task orders for those delivery services. So we released the draft uh, task order for the first one um, in early March, and we had a question and answer period with our contractors. We got some feedback, and we're close to releasing the final. Um, and we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule of, of what we were uh, predicting, which is great. So if we're looking at awarding that um, second quarter of this calendar year. And I know our, our, uh, our CLIPS partners are anxious to get going on this as well. Um, and then we're looking at an expected cadence of one to two task orders per year, uh, because what we want to do is build up that cadence of, of flights. I mentioned the 13 payloads we selected through the uh, NASA-provided um, lunar payloads. Um, this is a list. I won't go through them here. But what I will tell you is there is a mix of science instruments and technology demonstration payloads on here, such as uh, entry, descent, and landing technology demonstrations, which again will help the development of future landers, both robotic landers and the human landers. And then this was the external call that uh, Everyone likes to call LSIT-P. We're going to come up with a better name because that just doesn't roll off the tongue very well, I don't know about, for me at least. Um, and what we'll do is combine these into one call, uh, and we, we want to do that annually. The reason we had two calls was we wanted to get started as soon as we could. And we knew that we could um, have the NASA-provided payloads selected a little bit earlier than through the natural NRA process. And so um, we will have one call out to the community um, each year to, again, continue to populate that pipeline of instruments. Rover capability, I talked a little bit about it. Um, obviously, the primary drivers there are to include science objectives, and we're trying to uh, get to the moon with a rover as soon as possible. Um, we're, we're really trying to target 2023. Um, the science objectives, we're looking at the ground truth of the volatiles above the horizontal and vertical distribution. We're roughly looking at a three to 500 kilogram capability, uh, but that's not set in stone. We're, we're still looking through uh, what is the right size. Um, certainly we'll be going to one of the poles and uh, long duration operations. We, we'd like to be able to go and operate for a period of months, not, not just weeks. Um, and there are some opportunities for the Space Technology Mission Directorate to contribute to the, to the rover uh, strategies. And we're looking at several commercial acquisition approaches. Uh, so you'll be hearing more about that um, as, as we uh, progress. Gateway. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail because I think Jake will talk more about this. Um, what I want to talk about Gateway is this is a unique platform that offers uh, new opportunities to do science uh, in many different ways. And there was a workshop that was held a year ago, February, in Denver, where the um, Science community, and I mean the cross-discipline science communities, were brought together to find out what are the interests if we had a, a platform such as Gateway in cis lunar space. And it was a, a very productive um, workshop. Um, and based on that, we're now working with the human spaceflight folks on 
starting to define where external payloads could be mounted on the gateway um, and be able to provide the, that type of interface information in future announcement of opportunities through the various science divisions. Um, another way we could look at uh, gateway is not just necessarily mounting them to the external um, portions of the gateway, but use the gateway comm and data relay capabilities that it will have. And in fact, that will be on the first element, the power and propulsion element. And so we're working with HEO to find out what type of bandwidth capabilities will there be to offer. So there may be proposers out there that may not necessarily want to uh, mount to the outside of the gateway. They may want to be in lunar orbit or they may even want to be going to the surface and use the PPE as a common data relay. Um, here shortly, the uh, National Academies is going to kick off a workshop uh, of concerning science on Gateway. Um, I think they're looking at a kickoff roughly in the April timeframe. And uh, they'll be conducting that through, through the year. And then the human spaceflight folks are looking at conducting a more what I call technical interface uh, workshop uh, in the summer time frame, which will help flush out some of those interface um, details that we're all looking for. Uh, one thing we were very excited about a couple of weeks ago, the Canadian Prime Minister made a major announcement that uh, the Canadian government is on board and committed to be a partner in Gateway. They're going to provide the robotics, uh, what we used to call the arm on ISS and shuttle. Um, and certainly that will be a major enabler for the installation and change out of uh, instruments on the external portions of the gateway. So we're looking forward to that. International partnerships is another key part of this as well, not just the commercial partnerships, but international partnerships. And we're, we're in discussions with, with several of our existing partners and even potentially new partners. Um, in fact, right now in, uh, over at STEC in the Netherlands, there's a meeting going on uh, with many representatives from the various uh, worldwide space agencies with some of our folks from headquarters to kind of flush out where, how can they contribute to the overall exploration campaign. Administrator Bridenstine put out a letter to all the heads of agencies back in November asking for their ideas of how they would like to contribute. This meeting that's going on um, today and tomorrow is actually trying to flush that out so that then at the National Space Symposium, where the administrator is going to talk, there are going to be many bilats where we'll be able to maybe start figuring out exactly what areas we can concentrate together on. Um, this particular picture is interesting. This is the Space IL launch, the, you know, the bear sheet lander that's on the way uh, to the lunar surface. Um, that was a nonprofit company that worked with the Israeli Space Agency uh, to develop that lander. Um, we were asked rather quickly if there was anything we wanted to contribute to that lander, and we were successful in, in roughly a two-week time period to come up with an agreement on, and, and Lori and I got the action, so it was like, what can you do very quickly? And uh, so we, we talked with our folks at Goddard, we were able to put a uh, laser rector of reflector assembly on the bear sheet. So that is flying with the lander, and we're looking forward to a successful landing, I think, around the April 11th time frame. So um, again, the key here is we're looking to do this with our international partners as well, and I think it's very ripe for partnerships in that area, too, from an overall exploration campaign. And with that, I think that's the end of my talk. I'll turn it over to Jake. I look forward to your questions later. Thank you. Okay, um, first of all, before I get started, I would like to, since we're all thanking people, I'd like to go ahead and thank Ben Bussey. He didn't get out too easy this time. He left the chief scientist position recently, which is why I get to be up here and he's sitting down there. Uh, but he did this job for five years and I think he did a really good job, so. He's also been very helpful in bringing me on board, and I think it really drives to the point um, that I would like to make early on here is that, as Steve mentioned, SMD, HEOMD, STMD, we're all working together pretty much daily at all levels right now, uh, thinking about the exploration plan, and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about HEO's contribution to that. 
Uh, but it's a really exciting time. We have an exciting endeavor placed in front of us with some uh, ambitious goals that, um, to me, are very fun to take a part in. Um, I'll start out with the gateway, and, and I want to point out about the gateway. Steve gave a good introduction to it. It really is intended to be an international and commercial partnership. Uh, so not only are we testing our exploration capabilities, we're testing our um, abilities to work together here and build this platform. We intend Gateway to be the backbone that really enables us to explore the deep space environment. Gateway will be in an orbit that gives us a chance uh, to expose the spacecraft, the hardware, the humans to the deep space environment in preparation for learning how we can move onwards to Mars. Uh, so that's really uh, the key piece of Gateway here is learning how to um, work out in that environment. But it also affords us an opportunity to gain access to a family of orbits as well as to the lunar surface. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. As Steve mentioned, the power and propulsion element is the first part that will be placed in orbit. We intend to have it there in 2022. Uh, we have a call out right now and proposals are in uh, for vendors to provide that for us. So those are in review and we hope to have decision on that later this year. So this will be the first key piece in putting this together. Another important part, as Steve mentioned also, is the Canadian Space Agency is now committed partner to building the Gateway. Uh, they're a leader in robotic capabilities, so they'll be working with us as we put this together. We're also working with other international partners to evaluate options for their participation. The modular design of the Gateway is what really enables us to envision concepts that take parts from commercial vendors and the international partners. So I'll point out again that this is a configuration concept. Doesn't mean that the final product will look exactly like that because we're continually evaluating how we want to do this. And uh, so this will be an exciting uh, development for us as we move forward. This gives us a chance, as I mentioned, to conduct research in cislunar space. Uh, the orbit will grant us access and coverage to the poles, as well as views of the far side. Uh, so this can act as a communications relay to activities that might be going on on the far side of the moon. It also gives us a chance to test navigation capabilities, uh, extending Earth-based GPS constellation. Uh, we're looking at utilization of logistics modules. So the logistics modules are platforms that can be delivering hardware and capabilities to the gateway, uh, but they have a life cycle that's longer than the duration of time that they'll remain at the gateway. So these modules can then move on to other locations. We can put them into heliocentric orbit or other orbits around the moon. Uh, Steve mentioned uh, HUMD in partnership with SMD is planning a workshop, hopefully later this summer, to start really thinking about the technical aspects of how we want to conduct uh, payload experiments outside of the gateway. And so um, I want to just clear up a little bit here. It, that includes externally mounted activities. So you can imagine the gateway, like the space station, is some place that we can mount instruments. We want to understand better from the community what kind of instruments you might want to use on the gateway, what that requires of power, what the COM requirements will be. Um, and we want to understand things like how does the spacing of those mounting points relate to venting locations on the gateway. Uh, so we need to understand really how the science community wants to use the gateway before we can start making those decisions. Um, so this will be happening later this summer. We also hope to um, be able to provide the Canadian Space Agency with an understanding of how the robotics may uh, take part in that. Now, Beyond mounting instruments just on the exterior of the gateway itself, I mentioned the modules that could potentially depart from the gateway. We could uh, mount hardware on the outside of those modules. So you could imagine that if you maybe don't want to use an orbit the gateway resides in, it's not ideal for the science that you want to do, we'd like to know that. Maybe we can mount your experiments on a logistics module that may depart and enter into a different orbit. It may go into the heliocentric orbit. So just because the gateway itself is not in the orbit that you'd like to have doesn't mean that we can't work with you to provide what you need. For us to understand how to develop the gateway, we need to know how you want to utilize it. 
So this is another exciting part uh, from my perspective is trying to understand where we want to put hardware and experiments, ultimately trying to get down to the lunar surface. Um, we also will be conducting research in the lunar vicinity. Uh, we can hopefully get spacecraft or the logistics modules down into low lunar orbit. There we go. Um, so again, we can use some of this hardware as communications uh, relays much closer to the Earth, begin looking at navigation on the surface. As Steve mentioned, we potentially have rovers in the future on the surface of the moon. How can we support those activities from gateway or the modules that we're moving into different orbits? Ultimately, I think we would all like to get more pieces of the moon back to Earth. Um, gateway could play a central role in that. We would like to, again, understand your perspective on how the Gateway might take a part and take a role in getting rocks back here to the Earth. Ultimately, we're talking about surface access, robotic and human mission support, and we'd like to really drive towards getting humans on the surface. So as the Gateway is in development in orbit around the moon, we'll also be looking to land, human-rated lander, on the surface of the moon in the next decade. Uh, HEOMD recently released a broad agency announcement uh, that described our plan for a human lander. Uh, commercial partners are now evaluating the plan that's been developed over the last two years. They'll have a chance to respond with proposals for studies of that plan. Uh, those are coming in next week at the same time as we're having a um, decision analysis cycle meeting for human landers uh, down at Kennedy Space Center. So we're really getting ready to ramp up for this. What's interesting here that I want to talk about is the plan, it may be something that everyone's not fully aware of, is the architecture we're looking at. We're looking at a three-stage lunar architecture for landing humans on the surface. So as I mentioned, the gateway's coming together as we're adding modules in orbit around the moon. We'll also be delivering the three stages. Uh, so this includes um, the transfer vehicle, the descent element, and the ascent element. The transfer module will be able to carry the ascent and descent vehicle from the gateway into an orbit much closer to the moon. From that location, the descent module will then carry the ascent module to the surface. The ascent module, once the activities are done, will return to the gateway, as has the transfer module already returned to the gateway. What this means is that the ascent module and the transfer module will be reusable. And so again, the gateway becomes a test bed for us to begin exploring scenarios such as refueling, reusing, refurbishing hardware that has gone down to the surface of the moon. These are all steps towards being able to successfully make our way through deep space to Mars because we want to build this infrastructure in a sustainable manner. And that's where the partnerships come into play. This is not NASA by itself building the gateway, going to the surface of the moon. The partnerships are critical here. NASA is building what we believe to be the key parts of the infrastructure, and we're depending on our partners to also provide elements for exploration. And this grants us flexibility because if you are not getting what you want, you can begin to propose and develop ideas for how to work with the Deep Space Gateway uh, to explore the area you'd like to explore. So I'll end with the, uh, with the swoosh map as well here, uh, just to bring it back around and really try to reiterate the point that this isn't just HEOMD going alone or SMD going alone. This is a NASA-wide venture, and we're working together on a daily basis. And it's critical that we receive input from the science community here in this room to understand how you would like to use the hardware that we're developing. The goal right now for the human landers is to have a test of the descent module, just the landing. Uh, that would occur in 2024. In 2026, we'll run a non-crewed uh, test of all three stages that will bring in a, the ascent and the transfer module back to the gateway. And we will then refuel the gateway, or refuel, refuel the modules. And in 2028, we plan to take humans to the surface of the moon. So as I mentioned, this is a bold and exciting new time to be working uh, at NASA. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be able to work with everybody on this. And uh, we want to have all of you involved in this. And we're going to need your help. So thank you very much. I'll hand over to Lori.
All right. It's great to be here tonight. Um, I, this is actually uh, 25 years for me uh, for LPSC, so um, not not a 50-year uh, alumnus, but uh, certainly one that's been around a while. And this is a big part of my community, a community I've been a part of for a long time, and one that I feel a, a very close affinity to. And uh, I have to say, it's incredibly humbling to stand up here in front of this um, austere group. And, and be given a responsibility to uh, represent and to, to lead this community forward. So thank you for all of your support, and I'll do the very best job I can uh, in this role. I um, wanted to say that uh, you've heard a lot from Steve and from Jake about the collaboration across the various mission directorates um, at headquarters. But for me, it's an incredibly exciting time to be a part of NASA science. Uh, because we really do have a time when the lines between the different uh, scientific disciplines are getting, becoming more and more blurred. And we really do have a sense of an integrated science program um, within NASA. And I, and I love being a part of that. And I'm loving being able to have the opportunity to work with all of the science divisions uh, within NASA to advance um, our understanding um, and answer important questions about understanding the secrets of the universe, uh, discovering and looking for life beyond Earth, and, and trying to protect uh, and improve life back here on Earth. And all of the integrated science within NASA is trying to address these same three fundamental questions. Within planetary science, um, I'm sure you've seen this chart many times. This is our fleet chart. Um, I get very excited every time I see this. I think we have an incredible portfolio here within planetary science. And the, the longer I'm uh, sitting in the chair that I'm in now, uh, the more impressed I become with the portfolio that we have. Um, what you'll see up here, of course, is 14 missions that are currently in operations and another 10 that are in development. Um, and that's really um, quite an impressive program. Uh, those missions, of course, are either led by NASA or also in collaboration with some of our international partners. Uh, a lot of exciting work. Um, you'll see on this chart in the bottom right uh, an inset with all of the Mars missions, but you'll also see a new inset just to the left of that just for the moon. And that is in part because of all the incredible emphasis that's being put on the moon now. You've heard a lot about uh, what's going on within SMD and with HEOMD and working together. Um, we've added to this chart the um, uh, Space IL lander, the Beresheet that um, Steve was talking about. We also have added uh, Chandrayaan-2, which is an Indian space agency uh, lander, which we've also are in the process of putting laser reflector arrays on. Uh, we're, we're trying to populate the entire surface with as many laser reflector arrays as we can possibly get there. So that will also then uh, motivate the need to send another laser altimeter to the moon, so we just keep it going. Um, you'll also see on there the rover that uh, Steve and Jake have been speaking about. I wanted to spend a few moments talking about uh, budget. Uh, you will see right here, we were uh, fortunate several weeks ago uh, in mid-February that uh, a budget was finally passed for FY19. And I want you to take a close look at the top line on that budget. It says $2.7 billion for planetary science. <laughs> and unless I'm mistaken, that is the largest budget that planetary science has ever had. And I would like to take just a moment, number one, to acknowledge Jim Green, who has played a big role in getting this. And, and more importantly, even more important than Jim Green, yes, Chairman Culberson, who's sitting on the front row here. Thank you. For most, most of you know, but for some who may not, Chairman Culberson has been an incredible advocate for planetary science, and it is due uh, almost entirely to his efforts that we have this um, incredible top line budget. And uh, what you'll see uh, listed below that top line is a proposed operating plan that has not been approved. Um, so there are some uh, potential for some changes there, but. Uh, Essentially, we've, we see uppers across the board um, in all of the areas, um, including uh, 
a planetary defense program, which is now uh, a healthy program that supports uh, a variety of activities I'll talk about in a moment, the new lunar discovery and exploration program you've already heard about, um, a healthy discovery and new frontiers programs, which I feel very, very strongly about, uh, Mars exploration, outer planets, of course, very healthy in this budget, and a technologies program. So I think we're, we're all uh, in a good position. We shall be very pleased that we're, we've got a good starting point for, for this year. Um, I also wanted to just say a few words, um, not to confuse everybody. So we got an FY19 budget, which is real money we can spend. And then we also got the president's budget, which is a proposal for FY20, for fiscal year 20. And there are just a few points I wanted to um, make about the, the president's budget, which was rolled out a week ago. Um, I believe the details of that budget came out today. Um, and there's a few really important things that should be uh, of interest to this community. Um, first off, um, in the president's budget, we finally have permission to go forward with the Mars sample return mission. Um, and this is brand new, okay? So this is really important. To this point, we've, we've gotten a lot of support from Congress with funding to explore and try and study what a Mars sample return mission would look like, but we now have permission from the administration to move out on that. And so that is a really exciting development. Um, the President's budget also includes uh, pulling forward um, a launch of the Europa Clipper mission. And again, this is a place where Congress has uh, been giving us uh, plenty of money each year, thank you, uh, Chairman Culberson, to keep moving with a, an advanced uh, uh, launch date, but the administration kept proposing uh, later dates such as 2025. We've finally gotten to a point where Congress and the administration have come together and we've converged on a launch date in 2023. So this is a great advance for Europa Clipper. Um, note that the President's budget does not include funding for Europa Lander, um, but we are still getting some great uh, funding from Congress. So uh, it's, a, it's an important uh, objective and we'll continue to, to study moving that forward. Um, it also uh, includes uh, enough funding in the out years to support a healthy uh, five-year cadence for new frontiers, which is something recommended by the Decadal Survey, something I support as well and maintaining the two to three year cadence for the discovery missions. So again, these are, are really important pieces and we are um, looking forward to working with Congress over the next year to enact the next year's budget. So uh, we've talked a lot about the 50th anniversary of LPSC, but that of course coincides uh, with the 50th anniversary of Apollo. And this is an incredibly exciting year uh, celebrating uh, the amazing achievements of the Apollo program. and. Uh, We'll talk a lot about the moon, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the legacy of the Apollo program and how we're living it still here today. And I can't talk about every single mission. I told you there were 24 on that chart, so I can't talk about all of them, but I'm gonna hit a few highlights here. I love looking at the parallels between the Apollo program and some of the other science missions that we're doing now today. Um, up in the top right hand corner here, you can see Buzz Aldrin putting the uh, seismometer on the moon back in 1969. And this year, um, just over the last two months, we've been putting seismometers on Mars. It's the first time we've put seismometers onto the surface of Mars. The InSight lander uh, landed in November. Um, we've now got the seismometer uh, fully deployed. I'm sure some of you went to the InSight session this afternoon, um, taking some great data. We've got the heat probe sitting on the surface. Um, it's uh, really an, an amazing mission trying to uh, measure the heartbeat uh, of Mars. Uh, of course, one of the most important legacies of the Apollo program were the samples that were returned. Those uh, are still providing incredible science uh, every day. Um, and we now have multiple missions trying to bring samples from other bodies back um, to Earth. Between uh, Hayabusa, 2, Hayabusa 2 and uh, OSIRIS-REx, we're going to be getting samples back from some primordial near-Earth asteroids, and we're really looking forward to those, those uh, sample returns as well, again, with the opportunity to continue uh, trying to better understand the building blocks of the solar system. As I said, those uh, samples are the gifts that keep on giving, and uh, just a couple weeks ago or a week ago, we made an announcement that uh, we're actually going to open one of those Apollo samples that has never been opened before, one of the pristine samples. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
This is going to be an amazing opportunity to look for things that we didn't even know to look for when we col first collected those samples. Um, at the time they were collected, we thought that the moon was a dry and dead place, and now we know that there is ice and water there present. And so this will give us an opportunity to really see what uh, is in those pristine samples. Of course, uh, Lunar Discovery and Exploration Program helped to fund this activity as well. Thank you. And uh, uh, so we're really looking forward to this. We've got a great group of uh, nine teams uh, that have been selected uh, to participate in the opening and, and analysis of these samples. I want to talk a little bit about some of the really cool stuff that happened over the last several months. Uh, just a quick uh, shout out to the Marcos. These were the uh, Mars CubeSats. There were two of these. If you aren't aware, they were about the size, each one was about the size of a briefcase. Um, and they flew each independently all the way to Mars um, and really kind of changed the way we think about how we can do these types of missions. It was, um, if without these two CubeSats, we would have had to wait several hours to know whether or not InSight landed successfully on Mars. But because of these two uh, intrepid uh, CubeSats, they were able to give us almost real-time telemetry as the uh, InSight lander touched down on the surface and then immediately sent us back images from the surface, and it was incredibly exciting and a great demonstration of what can be done in a small package. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to one of our favorite rovers here. Uh, the whole Mars Exploration Rover Program was a, an incredible success. Um, Spirit, of course, um, did a great job for about six years, but Opportunity lasted for over 14 years, um, had an amazing legacy. Um, and again, change the way we think about doing planetary science, um, extending the capabilities of a planetary geologist and putting them onto the surface of another planet and letting them you know, roll up to various rocks and look at them up close and break them open and do uh, chemical analyses. Really just an amazing uh, mission. So we're, we're sad to see it go, but uh, it was an incredible mission. Uh, looking to the future on Mars, of course, the 2020 mission. Yeah. <laughs> For opportunity, yes, thank you. Uh, looking forward, uh, the Mars 2020 mission is on schedule for a launch in July of next year, July of 2020. Um, the hardware is starting to come together. It's integrating. They're making incredible progress. Um, really very, very excited about um, getting 2020. This is the first step in Mars sample return. And as such, just um, this year, uh, in November, or just last year in November, uh, Associate Administrator Thomas Zerbukin uh, got a bunch of information on several three different um, landing, potential landing sites on Mars and made a selection to land in Jezero Crater. Um, this is a really compelling site with lots of different geological um, type units there, including, most importantly, uh, a uh, uh, fluvial deposits uh, from a fan there where if there were ever life present in that ancient time, it ought to be present in this fan. So this is a great place to go looking for evidence of potential life-bearing molecules. And uh, we'll be going and collecting samples and caching them on the surface. And as I said, uh, we now are going to start thinking ahead to how we're going to get those samples back. And uh, so we're already looking, we've been looking uh, in collaboration with European Space Agency at a variety of concepts that could get those samples back. And we're now ready to begin in earnest trying to, to develop the plans for how we're gonna make that happen. Talk a moment about Europa Clipper. Uh, Europa Clipper, of course, uh, was the uh, uh, second highest priority flagship in the last decadal survey. Uh, an incredible amount of importance on Europa. Um, although the, de the uh, decadal survey came back and said the Europa mission that was uh, in there uh, needed to be scaled back a little bit. It was a little bit too expensive. We need to find a, a, a more cost-effective way to do it. And the Clipper mission meets that, uh, that requirement. Um, but the midterm, which was just conducted, uh, came back again and re reminded us that it is, is our responsibility to ensure that the Europa Clipper mission does not grow out of that box. And so we've been given a challenge to try and, uh, and, and, and keep Europa Clipper on track um, without, without growing um, excessively. And this is something that I will have to say, I don't think NASA does this very well, and that's to try and uh, control the costs of uh, flagship class missions. We tend to uh, let them grow. 
So uh, some of you may have heard there has been some activity in this area on Europa Clipper in the last few weeks um, to, to work on a, a new approach that hasn't been tried before in trying to uh, get early warnings of when there may be issues um, going on with a mission. And uh, in this case, uh, we did uh, look at the uh, ice mag instrument. And sadly, uh, after a lot of thought, a lot of discussion um, by the team and by headquarters, uh, Thomas Dubuquin made a decision to, to descope that instrument um, and to, uh, to terminate that, that project. Um, it was a really, really tough decision. It was a hard decision to make. Um, but again, uh, there were a variety of issues um, that led to that. A lot of uh, analysis was done. Uh, we are moving forward and ensuring, because it's so important to have a magnetometer on this mission, we are going to ensure that there is a facility magnetometer and are uh, pursuing uh, the magnetometers that were part of ISMAG, uh, the, the flux gates, the simpler, less complex uh, magnetometers that were being de uh, developed at UCLA, and we are pursuing those as the, the, a facility instrument um, as part of the Europa Clipper mission. And I'm sure there'll be questions later, and I'll be glad to answer those. Uh, a couple more highlights, New Horizons. Uh, I don't know if anyone went to that session this morning, another interesting session today about the New Horizons mission. What an amazing event that was. Of course, we were all, I was all on uh, forced uh, vacation at that time, but, um, but that didn't stop me from enjoying an incredibly exciting event up at APL. It was really an amazing uh, event there. Uh, and the data that are starting to roll back uh, from this uh, incredible flyby of Ultima Thule out in the Kuiper Belt are revealing this object to be probably the most primordial object we've ever seen before up close. It's, it's really just an incredible mission, and we look forward to the next year and a half of data rolling back uh, from New Horizons. Thank you. So I mentioned that we've gotten uh, a bunch of cost uppers this year, and one of them is in the area of planetary defense. And this is a really, um, I think, a, a great area for planetary science to be engaged in, because I can't think of who else has more scientific expertise in understanding near-Earth objects than uh, our planetary science division. And so we've stood up the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, which includes um, activities uh, such as ground-based and space-based uh, detection, tracking, and characterization of near-Earth objects. Um, but it also includes um, plans for uh, how to develop capabilities to mitigate uh, future potential impacts. Uh, the double asteroid redirection test is a, a mission being developed out at APL. They're now in their phase C. And, and working towards uh, uh, getting this mission ready to fly. This is a really cool mission that's going to fly to the Didymos uh, binary asteroid, uh, in, which will have a, a closest approach to Earth in 2022. And this mission will fly uh, and uh, actually impact the small moon of Didymos, uh, in, which will change the orbital period of that uh, small moon, will make observations from Earth and be able to understand much better how effective these types of uh, uh, redirection or uh, uh, deflection techniques can be. So this is a really cool mission. Keep your eye on it. You're going to be hearing a lot more about it as we go forward. Um, this slide is really just in here to remind you how important it is, not just to me, but to the Science Mission Directorate to really ensure that we uh, are building a diverse and uh, strong workforce for the future. And there's a lot of activities going on within SMD uh, to encourage uh, early career scientists um, across a diverse spectrum uh, to be engaged in all of the work that we do. And so we're we're strong proponents of that, and we're always looking to uh, build the next uh, generation. Of course, this is again at the New Horizons event uh, on New Year's Eve. All the future planetary scientists and engineers getting ready for the next round. Uh, I want to kind of close out with some uh, information on uh, some upcoming uh, 
activity within uh, the division. One thing I wanted to mention uh, was that we've actually had, before I get into this slide, is that we've had a little bit of changeover in uh, personnel in Planetary Science Division. Um, in addition to myself coming in, we just recently had the Deputy Division Director step down. So David Schur, who's been an incredible part of Planetary Science Division, uh, his last day was last Friday. He spent five years with Jim Green and one year with me. Um, he's been an incredible asset to the division, but he has uh, decided to move on and do work for Department of Defense. So he's got some new and exciting work there. Um, in his place now, we have um, in an acting role for Deputy Division Director, uh, Kate Wolf, who's probably not someone most of you are familiar with, but she's been the Deputy Division Director for the Resources Management Division in the Science Directorate um, for several years and she's a fantastic asset. She will be filling that role uh, during the interim while we advertise the deputy position. Um, it's also true that David did so many things that he couldn't be replaced by only one person. And so we also have appointed Joan Salute, whom many of you know, as a um, acting director for the uh, solar system uh, exploration portfolio that David covered. Um, so I'm really excited to have Joan on board as well. Okay. so. Uh, a few more things here. Uh, oh, I had one other thing I was supposed to mention. Sorry, I don't want to forget. Uh, we actually, there's going to be an ad coming out, uh, a multi-division ad coming out for program executives um, at headquarters. Um, and this is a call for program executives in all four of the science divisions, including planetary science. Um, but this is going to be a little different uh, way that we hire people. And so program executives, as you know, are the engineering side, the technical side of the headquarters team that works with each of our missions. Um, and this time we're hiring through something called direct hire authority, um, which is actually a much faster, more expeditious way with less red tape and less bureaucracy to bring people on. Um, so this is going to be happening very soon. There's going to be an ad posted from March 25th to March 29th. That is a very short time frame. It's only about five days. So if you're interested, you need to get your CV um, polished up and entered into USA Jobs because that's not an easy process and it's going to go quick. And I wanted to point out, some people may think that a five-day turnaround means that this is a rigged uh, call and that maybe people are already identified and that is not true. This is wide open. There is nobody pre-identified. It's going quick because we want to do a quick hiring process and not drag it out. So if people are interested, get, you know, be ready or let people know um, to get their resumes in. All right, moving on to more information here. Announcements of opportunity, just a couple of updates here. Uh, the Simplex program, uh, we've received a bunch of great proposals there. The step one reviews were completed um, back in the fall before the shutdown, and we are getting very close to being able to make announcements, um, but we expect probably no earlier than the middle of April. Um, keeping in mind that this first round of selections will be for the phase A, B, and that there will be a follow-on down select down the road um, for additional, um, additional funding or additional support. Uh, but we're looking to make some uh, selections uh, in the next few weeks. New Frontiers 4 um, is in the process of going through its uh, review process. The last two standing are CSER and Dragonfly. CSER, the Comet Sample Return Mission, and Dragonfly, the Titan Rotorcraft Mission. Um, these two missions have already submitted their concept study reports uh, before the shutdown. They're now um, getting ready for their site visits. I'm surprised to see Zibby here tonight. I haven't seen Steve Squires, but um, he may be here as well. But uh, getting ready for their site visits coming up very soon. Um, and we expect to make announcements uh, in New Frontiers 4 for that finally selected mission um, in about July. Discovery, I'm sure there's plenty of people in here wondering what's happening with Discovery. Um, we are on track with Discovery, despite uh, a little bit of a delay from the shutdown, but not much. Uh, the draft AO came out in the fall. Uh, we did extend comment period uh, because of the shutdown, but we're now expecting the final AO to be released very soon. In fact, I can assure you that it's very close, yes? <laughs> very close. It's, uh, it's almost ready to be approved, um, and then it will be coming out. Um, definitely before the 1st of April. And even if it comes out early, the due date for proposals will be the 1st of July. So be looking for that. Um, 
there's a couple key things I wanted to draw your attention to in the RNA program. Um, I do want to point out that Jonathan Rawl is going to be leading a town hall for the RNA program tomorrow in Waterway 4. Um, so I'm going to encourage you to go to that town hall if you have additional questions about the RNA program. But two key points I wanted to mention here were uh, we haven't for a couple of years had the uh, early career awards. We have a new approach to this um, called the uh, Planetary Science Early Career Award, um, and that's going to be uh, called this year in uh, Roses 19. Um, so again, go to the town hall for more information or talk to Shoshana Weider. Um, we also are looking for mentors, uh, for super mentors, not just any mentors, a super mentor. Um, these are mentors that replace the uh, planetary geology and geophysics undergraduate research program mentors. Anyone who has a solar system workings grant is eligible to be a mentor. And again, I encourage you to go to the town hall tomorrow if you want to ask more questions about that program. Um, real quick, uh, there was, of course, a midterm evaluation of our planetary decadal survey and how we, the Planetary Science Division, are, are doing against that. Uh, Louise Proctor was the chair of that panel. Thank you very much, Louise. Co-chair. Thank you. Yes, co-chair. And they did an incredible job uh, of uh, going through how uh, Planetary Science Division is doing and providing some excellent recommendations forward. Um, here I, I provide just a couple of key highlights from that midterm review. I encourage you to read it. Um, it's got lots of great information there. Um, some of the key recommendations, of course, are, again, a reiteration of trying to meet that discovery cadence of less than or equal to 24 months. That is a real challenge, but I will tell you that's something that I am working on very strongly to try and make sure we have a budget that allows us to uh, put out a call, a discovery call, every four to five years and try to make two selections with each one of those calls that allow us to try and bring that cadence um, a little tighter and, and make it uh, a little closer between those launches. Uh, of course, there was also another recommendation for New Frontiers 5 AO as soon as possible, and we're working towards trying to make sure we get that um, before, hopefully by the end of 2021, early 2022. Uh, certainly trying to keep it less than it was between New Frontiers 3 and 4. Um, and then there were statements in the midterm saying that uh, PSD is largely following or exceeding the recommended uh, levels for funding for RNA and technology. I think that's a great achievement and accomplishment, and we're going to work to sustain that. Uh, definitely something we want to maintain. Um, and then there was also a recommendation that NASA should conduct some studies, eight to 10 mission concept studies in preparation for the next decadal survey. And so this is something that uh, we also agree is something would be a great idea to do. Uh, doing things under the way we have in the past through science definitions teams has become a little bit of a bureaucratic mess at headquarters, and so we've been trying to get creative and find another way to pro provide the types of quality information that the decadal survey will need to evaluate what the priorities are and what types of missions can be accomplished in the next decade. So to that end, we have recently uh, released a new ROSES element for planetary mission concept studies. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about this as well, so I'm probably not going to dwell a lot on this slide. But the, um, there was an FAQ that was rela released um, last week, and there will be uh, subsequent FAQs released every week. We know that this is a new process. We know it's something that... Uh, we're all trying to figure out how to make this work the best way, and so we want to maintain a dialogue with you. Doris Dow is here down here. She's leading it, and so please make sure that you um, ask her questions, although we are trying to answer every question through the FAQ so everybody gets the same answers and the same information. If you have questions... Whoa! Back up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I did want to say that if you have, uh, if you want to find the uh, release or if you want to see the FAQs, they're on the Inspires website. And with that, um, I'm going to go on to my last slide here, which is actually a short film um, in honor, made especially for uh, this 50th anniversary LPSC, um, and in honor of the great accomplishments. Uh, of NASA's planetary program, in particular highlighting some of the, the key things that have gone on over the last year.
I think this is great that we're celebrating 50 years of the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. It started off with our Apollo missions. It brings together so many of the different aspects of planetary science. To keep advancing our exploration of the solar system. We've had quite a year here in the Planetary Science Division at NASA. We're trying to peer underneath the clouds of Jupiter. With insight on Mars. The OSIRIS-REx mission. New Horizons. And we just keep pushing the limits. For the past year, Juno has been trying to understand the interior of Jupiter. There's been a lot of interesting results. The core is not the way that we originally thought it was. It's in fact slightly more diffuse. People around the world have responded to the pictures that have been returned from the Juno camp. And they're pieces of scientific art, it's real images, real data, but there's also been the opportunity for some of the citizen scientists to participate in the production. So in the coming years, we'll have a fantastic data set about the interior structure of the planet, and we'll have a much better picture of how planets are formed, how their interiors are set up broadly across the universe. As the agency turns towards going back to the moon, a lot of that starts with science, where we put together this CLIPS program, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. These commercial companies are going to take our payloads to the moon for us. It's been a really long time since we've been to the surface of the moon, and this is an opportunity for us to go not just once or twice, but repeatedly, and be able to do some amazing science. We have this great opportunity of exploring Mars with multiple spacecraft on the surface and in orbit. Some of the highlights over this past year, InSight landing, all the instruments have been deployed. We'll be getting all the information that we need to build a baseline to understand whether or not Mars has Mars quakes. Curiosity has now arrived at the clay bearing unit, one that we've seen from orbit that tells us that water was there, just recently, we declared that the Opportunity mission is over, but we can celebrate what a fantastic mission that has been and telling us so much about the planet Mars. The New Horizons team has just received the closest approach data from Ultima Tholi, and it is truly breathtaking. Ultima Tholi turned out to be an extraordinary object which surprised us. The wealth of data will continue to enrich our knowledge base for generations to come. The OSIRIS-REx mission has been on its way to a near-Earth asteroid called Bennu. That's the smallest body we've ever orbited and the closest orbit to a body that's ever been achieved by a spacecraft. This type of asteroid may have delivered the building blocks of life to Earth after the Earth cooled. We already learned an awful lot. It's a lot more rugged than we expected, which is going to make our job a little bit more interesting, you could say, a little harder to find a safe place to go get a sample. We're looking forward to so many things that we're going to be achieving over the next few years. I really do think we're in the golden age of exploration of our solar system. So, so with that, I'll just say thank you to LPSC. Thank you for having us here tonight. And we're going to open up the floor. I think Eileen is going to, um, oh, Louise is going to moderate. Fantastic. I'm going to sit back down. I did want to make sure I uh, pointed out Michael New is here. Um, in, the, in the interest of not standing here and presenting to you all night and getting to the questions and answers, he has agreed to uh, just take questions. So we'll, we're all available for questions. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Brittany, you're up first. Oh, and be sorry, before you ask your question, if everyone could state their name and their institution, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Brittany Schmidt, Georgia Tech, I'm also the co-chair of the Europa Clipper Habitability Working Group. Um, so my question, of course, is about ICEMAG. Um, and so a few things I wanted to point out quickly is that uh, the central theme of Europa Clipper is, of course, to explore Europa to investigate its habitability. And a magnetometer, and particularly the one that, that has just been descoped, has been a major component of almost every mission study um, and was selected because of its importance. In fact, it's the instrument that, that discovered the ocean on Europa in the first place. One of the central uh, themes that we're trying to get at is the history of the ocean and how it operates as our archetypal ocean world. And the magnetometer is unique in its ability to do that. I'd like to make sure that because most of the community has only seen the press release, 
that a lot of other information comes forward and the fact that um, the numbers were perhaps a bit disingenuous in terms of cost growth compared to other factors in the mission. And one of the important things about it is that when the missions or when the instruments propose to a four instrument or five instrument spacecraft and then we select nine investigations, there's a large accommodation issue there. And so because of delays during that process, there's a bit of an asymmetry in how some of the instruments have been treated and how that process has operated. Um, and so the cost triggers uh, came into effect to identify issues. So my other comment is that the entire Europa Clipper team has gotten together over the past year to evaluate the internal study done by uh, the ICEMAG team and its incredibly capable and universally supported PI, Dr. Carol Raymond. And what I wanted to understand was, given these asymmetries, given the universal support, including letters of support coming directly from the Habitability Working Group, um, and the importance of this instrument, given the asymmetry in how particular accommodation was handled, and given that included in their uh, descope or their uh, cancellation review process, the, the ICEMAG team actually presented a descope to a four flux gate magnetometer with the science team included and presented a cost and a detailed plan for that. I'd like to understand better why the decision was made to descope to the same instrument but cutting out the science team and why there is some thought that that would actually save money. Thanks, Brittany. I appreciate your comments. Um, I, I want to say that I have a tremendous respect for Carol Raymond and her, her science capabilities and, uh, and, and definitely respect her as a scientist, absolutely. Um, I'll say that um, I think there's a lot of emphasis on the, uh, from the community on statements having to do with the cost of the instrument. And I will tell you that um, although I did not make the decision, this was a decision of Thomas Zerbuchen, the AA, I was present in all of the review processes and the uh, presentations that were made. Uh, the emphasis is not so much on the overall cost growth, but on um, the other risks that were um, inherent in the design and in the approach that was going forward. And so I think that most of the concern had to do with the uh, future risks and the fact that the, um, the instrument was not uh, stabilizing. Um, I don't necessarily want to go into all of the details here in this environment, but um, certainly um, the decision was made to reduce the complexity of, of the uh, instrument and to go forward with the facility approach um, to try and better manage that going forward. It includes the uh, flux gates, the simpler, less complex instruments that are being developed by UCLA to try and streamline the, uh, the timeline, the schedule, and uh, hopefully keep the cost within control. Yes. I'm going to rotate the mic. So over here, please. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Carolyn Crow, University of Colorado Boulder. So we've heard a lot today and over this weekend about sample return missions, right? We have active sample return missions. Uh, with the gateway, we're going to get samples from the moon. Now we're able to go ahead with 2020. But one of my questions is about what we do when those samples come back. So there was the recent National Academies report titled Strategic Investments in Instrumentation and Facilities for Extraterrestrial Sample Curation Analysis. And basically the gist is, is that we're not necessarily ready to analyze those samples when they come back. Um, there's been lots of advancements in analytical capabilities, but then also I like the term that was used in the last presentation. A lot of these laboratories are multi-generational, um, which means that if we're not investing in these labs now, we have a risk of losing early career scientists, but then also the um, more experienced scientists. So my question is, what is NASA's plan to invest in new laboratory facilities so early career people can get uh, established before these samples come back? And then what is the plan to invest in current laboratories to update them to make sure they're cutting edge and make sure that we're um, continuing on that legacy that we've been developing for the last 50 years since Apollo? 
That's a great question. I wish I had all of the answers for you right here tonight, but um, I do agree that absolutely there's got to be investments in those facilities. There's no point in bringing the samples back if we're not ready to look at them. And so absolutely, and as you say, multi-generational. Um, we've got to have the, um, the capabilities, the, um, the laboratory facilities, the analysis capabilities, and the people. It's the human power that's going to be able to, to do that. Um, looking forward to uh, really trying to ingest the information from that Academy's report and, and develop a plan forward. And so we're in the process of, of trying to figure out how we're going to do that. But thank you so much for the question. Okay, Mark? Uh, Mark Sykes, Planetary Science Institute. Uh, I'm always happy to hear about increased funding, money for research and data analysis programs. And, but the proof is always in the pudding, you know, because expectations and even some initial analyses don't stand up to detailed information. Uh, at this meeting in years past, uh, uh, there was detailed information on each program element uh, distributed to everybody. I've had to file FOIA requests to get that information the last couple of years. And I would hope that, that we could get back to you know, more transparency in providing detailed program element level uh, budget information uh, for the community because RNA is scattered across a bunch of lines. It's not just like look at the planetary research uh, 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 line and that, that's it. It's like, nah, it's, it's, it's also in a bunch of other places and there's stuff in the planetary research line. That's not RNA. Uh, the other thing that I was hoping that we'd get some transparency on uh, is, is the fraction of this money that's being given to centers without competition that uh, Jonathan Rawl first uh, announced, I think it was last, last year, that it'd be going on for a year. That was the first time I heard about it. But I think that, uh, first, personally, I wouldn't include that in, in terms of any decadal uh, compliance if it's just being given away to center scientists. And, uh, but it'd be nice to know just exactly how much that is out of what programs. Question mark, and um, so you're re referring to the internal scientist funding model, and this is something that was implemented actually just, uh, it began in FY18, although it didn't even begin funding at the beginning of FY18. It's really only been um, in place for about a year. Um, this program is across um, all four science divisions, and the uh, intent of the program was to look at the scientists at the various centers that are being funded through the RNA programs and, um, and identify the levels of funding that they were being supported at. And then instead of uh, requiring that civil servant workforce, not just that, but the, the work going on there to uh, overload all of the programs with uh, proposals is to, uh, for the, where they've been having sustained funding, uh, provide some of that funding to them, and then we get from that not only the scientific research that they're doing, but in addition the community service that they can provide through serving on panels and the ability um, to pr make their facilities available to the community as well. Now that is, it's ongoing. This is a, a pilot program, um, and I can actually hand it over to Michael <laughs> if he wants to answer a little bit more. He's chomping at the bit, I can tell. Oh yeah, thank you. Tall people. So yeah, so it is in basically year one-ish, one and a half-ish. Uh, at the end of three years, three cycles, um, we'll evaluate it. There's a set of nine preset metrics about how effective the program has been. One of those metrics is the, the lack of change in the balance between funding going to centers versus funding going to non-centers basically. Um, like I said, we're only in a year and a half-ish in. Um, we're going to be evaluating it a uh, couple years from now. I don't, beyond that. Um, well, since it's taking money out of these programs, it would be nice to. It's not taking money out of the programs. It's money that was already usually going to the center scientists. That out of those are, programs. Out of those programs, certainly. But it was money that center scientists had been getting ahead of time. Before, I mean. And so, through proposals. And this is not just giving, you make it sound like we're just, you know, walking into a center and giving people brown envelopes full of hundreds. And well, we're not. Maybe they're plastic bags. <laughs> Shrink wrap, actually, but, you know. 
No, I, I'm just saying that it'd be nice to, to get some information, some, some actual information about it instead of we may tell you something in three years or two years no, no, no. or whatever. No, no, no. Three years or two years, we're actually going to evaluate right. whether we're going to continue it. Yeah. yeah. Um, the information, I don't know what's planned for the town hall. Um, because I'd say there's probably a lot of organizations that wouldn't mind the same kind of consideration. Ah, except there's a major <laughs> difference, Mark. The major difference is that NASA employs those civil service scientists. That's another NASA question. NASA does not employ <laughs> professors at the University of California, Berkeley, for example. <laughs> NASA hired them. We have an obligation to support them to do work that is both of interest to them and of importance to the agency. We don't want to upset the balance between the amount of money we send out of house to the amount of money we send in house. But I'm, I'm just saying there needs to be transparency. Fine, of course. Fair statement. Fair statement. All right, cut. I'm Kerr Rutherford, Southwest Research Institute, San Antonio. I'm also the Federal Relations Subcommittee Chair for the AASDPS, and I'll speak on behalf of them today. I'm glad to say that, to hear you say that uh, NASA tends to overrun in flagships and uh, that we need to control these costs. I think that's especially true in times of record high budgets, and we don't want to look like we're ungrateful. Um, but you did bring this up in the context of Europa Clipper and the ISMAG experiment, which is a small instrument on, on a projects that's being run really, really well. I myself am a, a PI on uh, Europa Clipper, Europa UBS. We just passed our CDR with flying colors, no problems at all. So the mission as a whole is doing great. Yet, um, you know, Mars 2020 came up and, and went by and you didn't say anything about the cost problems on Mars 2020 and, and what you're gonna do against it. Can you tell us the cost first and how you'll implement things on both Mars 2020 and Mars sample return to come? Sure. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Kurt. No, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the Mars 2020, and I, and I should have brought that up when I brought up the slide. Um, so yes, there has been some cost increase on, on the Mars 2020, and I will say, um, keeping in mind uh, that uh, Mars 2020 is at a different point in its development than, than the Clipper mission, okay? And yes, there has been cost increase, but uh, part of what we're trying to do uh, with the process that's being implemented on Clipper is to try and not end up in the same position where we've got the, the kind of cost growth that we're seeing. Um, now, with uh, 2020, uh, yes, there has been cost growth, but I will tell you it's still, um, you know, it is less than 15% uh, over the agreed upon cost for 2020, so it's, it's still coming in uh, at that level. Um, and I will also say that um, in trying to accommodate the costs, um, and I don't know if you asked this question, but I'm going to answer it anyway, um, in trying to accommodate the costs for 2020, uh, there's been a very uh, strict approach um, in trying to look to the project first for economies and, and find ways to, to find ways to cover some of the cost growth. And then outside of that, to go into the to go into the Mars program, the program office, and then uh, the program itself, um, to try and uh, to cover those costs to have the, the smallest impact uh, as possible to the overall planetary portfolio. I can tell you that none of the FY19 uh, funding is going into into that right now. But um, we're you know the. So we're, we're, we're working to accommodate that within the MARS program and to not impact the rest of the planetary portfolio. So um, could, could you also clarify that Europa Clippers cost issues are not impacting the portfolio at all? Because it's an order of magnitude less total dollars you're talking about? That'd be a good thing to add. The Europa Clipper is, is not impacting the rest of the planetary portfolio either. That is true. It's within the, within the margin. Okay. That's Great. correct. Thanks, Kurt. Question over here. Maybe a non-question for Laurie, like maybe an sure. exploration. We question. have other panelists. Uh, I think maybe one other panelist could take it. Um, my, I'm Craig Hardgrove from Arizona State University. Um, my question is about the the CubeSats that are manifested on SLS EM1. Um, there's a little bit of uncertainty right now uh, about that, and I was just curious if there is a study going on, if the CubeSats that are currently manifested are being considered as part of that study, or if you can give us any details on uh, where those might end up. Not that either one of us is aware of. Is there a study going on at the moment? Um, okay. 
Very good. Michelle. Uh, Michelle Manetti from Framework. Uh, sorry, Lori. I think this is a question for you. Uh, it's a question regarding the planetary mission concept call. Yeah, and I guess I'm uh, trying to understand how the mission concepts that are selected and then costed through that process will kind of be compared or contrasted, or if they will at all, to kind of white papers that come in from the community into the decadal survey process, because I think that is the f uh, pathway that many of these mission concepts have been brought in. So they obviously will not be at the same level of maturity when they are considered by the decadal survey. How will that be balanced or considered? That is a great question, Michelle. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I will tell you what's in my mind is a concept for how this is going to work. And as I said, this is something that we're trying to work with the community to provide the best information to the decadal survey as we possibly can. Um, if I had an unlimited amount of funding, I would fund as many studies as I possibly could, but I don't. So I have a, a limited number, so we're going to do um, a subset of, of concepts that, that we can afford to, to do to put into the, the decadal survey process. And as you say, those will be at a slightly different uh, maturity level than something that goes in as a, as a white paper that hasn't had the opportunity for an engineering study and a costing estimate. Um, what I envision here, um, hopefully, is that these concepts will go into the decadal survey. The white papers will also go into the decadal survey, and then the panels can look at these and develop their own sense of priorities and get an understanding of which, if any, will need some additional study. Um, the last time around, when we did the last decadal survey, um, everything went in as white papers, and then all of the studies had to be done as part of the decadal survey. And not only did that put a tremendous load on each of the, the engineering centers, um, it was very difficult to manage within the, the schedule of the decadal survey. So the idea here is to at least get some of these done in advance um, so that we don't have to do that work as part of the decadal survey process. We've got that work leading in. We've got the, the technical design, or at least a, a concept there um, at some level with a, an advocacy cost estimate that can go into the decadal process. They can then have an independent cost estimate if once they've decided what it is they want. Um, and then the, the additional white papers will feed in to see if we, they have enough of what they need or if they need um, additional study for something further. Does that help answer your yeah, question? thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, just before we go on, because we are almost where we're supposed to be at the top of the hour, and I know everyone's getting hungry or hangry, um, I'm going to just stick with the four people who are already at the mic, okay? So I think we'll say any other questions, we should just suggest you take them offline. So, Candy. Candy Hansen, PSI. Uh, I was just curious when the uh, Juno participating scientists are going to be uh, selected or announced. It's been, I think, almost a year since the proposals went in. Who's going to tell me the answer for Juno? Who's on call? <laughs> I'm going to phone a friend on that one, Candy. <laughs> Did it um, like drop? Has it dropped through the cracks? Is this no, no, what no, the problem is? no. Oh, Kelly, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> phone a Found a friend, got gotcha. you. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Um, there are, uh, there's been some things that are being uh, reworked on that, and so stay tuned. That's all I can say at this point. But there's Weeks, been months, like at the time scale. Yeah. So um, I actually I can't I, I don't know I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but okay. I know I wanna, my understanding there's been a is it's very the, close. But I yes. We've been hearing very close. For a I know. I know. I'm sorry, Candy. And a lot of. The, Again, we point to things like the shutdown delaying things, and but yep, it is being worked. Yeah, I know. I don't blame you. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Candy, I, hear you. Uh, I will tell you that for all of the all of the programs that have been run through the through the roses, we are working really diligently to try and get them all closed out. The ones that have already had their reviews, um, and so we are really working those. I can't tell you a date, but it is we're we're getting there. Sorry, Candy. All right, Marty. Yeah, uh, this is the multi -Gri party JPL. Uh, the presentations uh, before were fantastic that we are having a new vision going to moon, uh, cis-lunar missions uh, with human explorations, uh, 2028. It's excellent. And I think it is going to energize everyone in the community. But my question is, uh, how, if we are locked into this 2028 uh, human mission approach right now, how the funding and uh, the scenario for the rest of the planetary sciences is going to be over this time period and beyond? 
how the community has to orient itself. Uh, are there any thoughts about it? So I'm not clear if that's a question for planetary science or for uh, for Jake with the human exploration because that the uh, the 2028 um, landing of humans, of course, is within Human Exploration Directorate. Um, uh, within planetary, uh, we're supporting the the science activities that can help support the human exploration, um, and uh, we're going to keep advocating for the strong planetary science, including strong lunar science. Um, and Mars science to help lead the way uh, for, for human exploration uh, on the moon and beyond. So I don't know, Jake, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I think the important point uh, that I'd like to reiterate is that we are talking uh, regularly about how across the three directorates uh, we can try to accomplish the goals that you're asking about. Uh, I can't say that there's a plan in place right now uh, but we are just beginning to roll out the study through the broad agency announcement. Uh, we haven't even received the proposals in from that yet. Uh, so, but, you know, we're talking about that. And as Lori just said, we want to make sure that science is, is a big part of human exploration, both in cis lunar space and hopefully down to the lunar surface. So those conversations will be ongoing as we develop the architecture and make those decisions. And the rest of the programs will remain the same uh, in the planetary science institution? Yes. yes I mean, okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there's no, no, no intent or, or desire to make any changes to the programs that we have in the planetary science program. Yeah. All right. Yeah, hi. Uh, Richard Benzel, MIT. Um, Lori, you mentioned integrating across all the elements, and so now I want to involve Steve and Jake and Michael. You may know that uh, we're on the cusp of flying a survey mission to discover the near-Earth object population. That mission is NEOCAM. I have no association with NEOCAM. I'm just an asteroid scientist. But I just want to know, have you started to think about getting out of the Earth-Moon cradle and uh, having accessible destinations? A sur asteroid survey would find the, the most accessible objects for those first human milestone steps out of the Earth-Moon cradle and in-space resource utilization. And so when the topic of planetary defense and surveys come up, the entire agency ought to be in, engaged and involved and enthusiastic and supportive of that. And I just wanted to ask whether you guys are all talking about that and realizing what a cross-agency benefit, not only to the safety and security of civilization, but the future of exploration that kind of mission will entail. Jake, Steve? Yeah. That that's a great question, great points. And uh, I'd like to say that the interesting and exciting thing about um, our plan forward is the flexibility. So um, I'm, we, you know, we have the, the slogan, moon to Mars, and, but that does not exclude options along that pathway. And so as the gateway is coming together, um, I'd like to reiterate the point that we would like to have that kind of input from the science community. Our hope is to continue to host workshops uh, collect input and information from the science community to understand how you all would potentially use this kind of a platform. And as I mentioned, that's uh, intended to be our backbone for understanding how to survive in deep space. So as we learn in cislunar space how humans are going to survive there, it, you know, tell us how you would like to use that. We're trying to look at um, how to use the modules, utilization modules, to explore other locations in heliocentric orbit. Uh, as if we get to the point of moving on towards the Mars system, you know, tell us how you would like to get there. I think we're very excited to hear about the results uh, from the observations you're talking about, and that will certainly tie into our planning as we move forward over the next decade. Yeah, so this is Steve. I might add also that, um, you know, I talked about external uh, science instruments and payloads. Keep in mind, too, the platform could be used as, as a uh, platform to launch other payloads from as well. I mean, we've been talking about that, um, not just CubeSats, but maybe it's a platform that you could use to send a spacecraft or more or a constellation from uh, Gateway to other locations to do what you're suggesting. Um, and as, as Jake mentioned, um, the Gateway will be able to be moved and if, if it's a priority and we feel that it's a good uh, mission to then take it out of the NRHO that's planned for now and take it in a different orbit, then we'll, you know, from a community aspect, then, you know, we'll be looking at uh, strategies to do that as well. 
So as Jake mentioned, it's a very flexible architecture. And again, science is um, right there at the seat at the table talking with them along with Space Technology Mission Director as well. You mentioned ISRU. Some of the ISRU technologies that we're looking at now and talking to the community about uh, could potentially feed forward to what you're suggesting as well, not just the lunar surface. All right, thank you. Last question. <laughs> Renee Weber from NASA Marshall. And I also wanted to ask Steve Clark a question uh, about the CLIPS program and how you see the CLIPS program feeding forward into future Discovery and New Frontiers missions that also want to go to the surface of the moon. As capabilities increase, as, as uh, those capabilities are on-ramped onto the commercial uh, services, we will be certainly looking at those type of class missions as well. Um, and they don't have to be just Keep in mind the, the landing services that we're starting out with. They're, uh, on the contract now, there is, it doesn't limit to lunar landers. It's orbital assets as well. It's rovers, it's mobilities. It's, it's a pretty wide open uh, delivery service contract. And we expect, we fully expect um, the uh, enhanced capabilities to be able to do what you're suggesting to evolve into that. And so, uh, you know, if this is successful, which we we think it will be with various companies. I think we'll we'll have that capability in the future. Can I add just a, a little bit to that? I don't know if my mic's still on. Hello. Uh, thanks, Renee, for the question. And I think you know Steve's right. You know, if we're really successful here, we're going to develop some incredible new capabilities from a variety of different um, sources um, that could provide rides to the moon. Um, and I think we're going to see some, uh, you know, really innovative uh, new types of discovery class missions or simplex type missions, or, or I think we're going to see a variety of different things. And uh, it's going to open the door. I'm, I'm hopeful that it'll really open the door to new uh, creativity. All right. And I just have one final quick announcement, which is uh, the exhibits downstairs are now open. There's a reception down there. So please do go and have a look around and have something to eat. And with that, let's thank our panel for a wonderful night tonight.